My dad was a small business owner in Spokane. He owned his own moving and storage company. It's part of me growing up with working on the trucks with the guys who were his employees and making sure they didn't think that I was going to rat on them in some way. I, I, I formed lots of friendships with nice guys who did hard work, and uh, I had to earn their respect. Um, so I got out of Harvard Business School in 67. These days, if you get out of Harvard Business School, you go to Wall Street. I was not interested in becoming a financier. That didn't appeal to me. Um, instead, I went to consulting, management consulting. And not because I wanted to be a management consultant, but because I would be exposed to problems in a business culture, and I might find some, some small business that I liked and get my experience running one of those. I wanted to have the real experience of running a company. I also wanted to have experience turning around a company. Um, I also had some friends that were in venture capital. Frank Caulfield is one of the original venture capitalists out of the early 70s, uh, made a lot of dough, very successful, was a friend from our consulting days together. And so he introduced me to venture capital. I worked for him in a company which Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers provided the financing. It wasn't turning out. They needed some advice. Um, and so I learned a lot about venture capital and later formed my own company and had him on the board. But management consulting, line management, turning around venture capital, those were the legs on which I kind of built my career. Uh, and it turned out more interesting than I might have expected. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, I turned around one company three times. Uh, I, I don't know very many people who've had that experience, and I did find it really pretty fascinating. PLM, sometimes called Francisco, sometimes PLM Railcar Maintenance Company, was that company. I would join it in the beginning. The first one was that they were losing money. I asked the treasurer how much he was going to lose in the month I joined. He said, uh, maybe we're going to break even. We lost 100,000 bucks. I learned very quickly that you couldn't count on what the people necessarily told you about what would happen. But we took the company from losing $3 million in the first year, and five years later we had two publicly traded companies who were making $5 million together. So I kind of earned my beginning bones as a, as a turnaround guy. What PLM did was to maintain railroad equipment. That was the entrepreneur who started the fish business, great insight. He realized that you could start a company based on the fact that utilities in the United States were going to have to buy their own coal cars when the United States had to go from oil to coal as a power source. And he managed to get a lot of money to build shops. And we ended up, when I came aboard, we probably had 12 or 13 shops all over the United States, from Waycross, Georgia, to Sioux City, Iowa, to Mile City, Montana. Um, some of them were small, some of them were large. Mile City was the former yard of the Milwaukee room. And we, uh, we had room for probably 300 cars in that yard. Um, we had an inventor who started the Sioux City, Iowa shop. Sioux City was interesting because it was a slaughter yard. I mean, they were a great town for being a slaughterhouse. And when you're dealing with the waste when you've killed a lot of cattle, you need to have a very sophisticated sewer system. And Sioux City had that. They could unload the product from a tank car convert it and have it back in service in 24 hours. And they did that with cars that were carrying asphalt that 24 hours later were so clean that you could put Jewish food in them and have them koshered by the rabbi and it would take <laughs> off. I mean, it was a pretty remarkable thing. And Dick Levenger, the guy who started the shop, said, look, um, tank cars are poorly designed. If you look at what a... It's hard to hear. Okay. Um, if you look at a railroad tank car, I'm going to move closer. If you look at a railroad tank car and you're driving by it, you see this big shell and you assume that that's the whole car. What you discover when you know more is that that's just a cover. Underneath that is a smaller tank that contains the, the, the lading, as they call it, whatever's being transported. And on the outside of them, you have these manifold-like pipes and they carry steam. And the reason they carry steam is that in the dead of winter, if you're carrying high fructose corn syrup, you have to warm the contents up to get it out. Um, and so he said, you know what you really should do? If you do the conventional car, you're really cooking from the outside in. And if you have high fructose corn syrup, you're going to burn it. It's dangerous. But if you put plates on the bottom of the car instead, and you put steam underneath them, 
you can get convection currents going. The stuff on the bottom is going to get hot. It's going to want to get to the top. That's going to stuff, call the stuff on the top to get down the other side. And meanwhile, it has the benefit that it keeps an even temperature. You don't worry about some parts of that place having, OK, even more. I'll hold it. Maybe that's better. Um, it, it keeps an even temperature for everything that's inside that car. So a car, an Archer Daniels Midland car, they were a client of ours. When they got to Chicago, within eight hours or six hours, they could begin unloading. Well, that experience, dealing with Dick and what he did and what he said, led directly to what happened to me in Russia. 